bigger screen. <laughs> So thank you very much for having me here. It's uh, my third year in a row, actually, and I really like to come here. It's a great place, and it, actually the growth of this conference shows you that one person or a team can really make a difference, and I really appreciate being here. And I want to give you kind of a delayed updates on colorectal cancer. You know, it's supposed to be at 8, but, you know, we're, and I know you all waited for that. You know, that's why you're here. But it's great to, for me to look at, you know, the advances we've seen in CLL. I actually have... CLL envy when I see how many drugs, how many, uh, you know, it gets complicated to pronounce these drugs, as you know. And, you know, you see the waterfall plots and they all go down. You know, it's just crazy, you know, to see what happened. So we're not there yet in colorectal cancer. So here are my disclosures. I want to, I, I don't know how much time we'll have because I want to focus a lot on adjuvant therapy of colorectal cancer. You know, you've, in recent years, we've talked a lot about targeted agents, sightedness, we'll come back to that in a second, immunotherapy, BRAF, you know, this will all happen too, but I think the, uh, the really change in standard of care, or let's say I propose it as a change in standard of care, at ASCO came with the plenary presentation of my colleague at Mayo Clinic, uh, Shen Shi, who presented the data from the IDEA collaboration. Adjuvant therapy, we haven't really had changes in adjuvant therapy since 2004, and it's time to really revisit the idea how do we optimally treat our patients? So I'll focus a lot on that. I'll give you some background to make you understand why I have changed, and actually more changed than I thought I would, my clinical practice in adjuvant therapy. So we'll talk about this here. How did adjuvant therapy come about? In 1990, Chuck Motel at Mayo Clinic published these data on 5-FU levamizole, you know, as adjuvant therapy for Duke C colon cancer, uh, which looked at a treatment duration for a year. And it was clear that compared to surgery alone or levamazole alone here after surgery, combination of 5 few levamazole really improved outcome. Indisputable. 12 months of adjuvant therapy. This is how I started to treat patients when I grew up in oncology. How did we come to six months? So there was a intergroup study which was presented in 1997 and published eight years later. I mean, there's a writer's block gap, as you can see. The study didn't even have a pre-specified non-inferiority hypothesis. What it tried to show was looking at the old uh, duration of therapy, levamazole, five of you, 12 months, and then have three different arms of six months of therapy. There was no direct comparison, 5 of levamazole, six months versus 12 months. There were different arms with leucovorin, or leucovorin plus high-dose leucovorin, low-dose leucovorin, leucovorin plus uh, levamazole. So really not a formal comparison in duration. But we all accepted that these curves were similar. And we said, you know, we want to really reduce our duration of therapy. So there was no formal hypothesis. There was no appropriate control arm. There was really not even a hazard ratio given for comparison. And we really don't know whether 12 months of 5 of might be better. We just didn't know that. But we accepted it because we wanted to accept it. We wanted six months to be the substitute for 12 months for our patients. One trial, which you probably have never really heard about, which I think is very important to understand what happened in the IDEA collaboration, was this study from the UK. 800 patients, and they tested six months of 5 of leucovorin, bolus 5 of leucovorin, Roswell Park or Mayo Clinic regimen, people could choose, to continuous infusion of three months of 5 of like putting patients on a pick line for three months and just infusing 5 of and you can see here, the dotted line up here, the superior line, is actually the continuous infusion, three months, compared to six months, bolus, five of you. The study met a non-inferiority margin, did not show superiority, because it was under power to do that, but you can see the trend is clearly in favor of using three months of continuous infusion, five of you. It seems to be that a continuous administration of a fluoropyrimidine is really able to shorten the duration of adjuvant therapy, because that's the conclusion we see here. Now, why didn't this really enter our practice? This was published in 2005. In 2004, oxaplatin became, uh, became approved as adjuvant therapy, so the field had moved on to Falfox. And we kind of ignored this, and there was not a 
the trend to, let's say, you know, let's lose use this continuous infusion fiber here as a backbone and just add oxaplatin to it. These studies were never done. So in, from 2004 on, we kind of had to ignore these data because, again, we had better therapy. Now, you know, Mosaic came around. This is the Fall Fox study, and it showed improvement in th five year disease free survival, 7.5% in stage three, even in high risk stage two, 7.2% disease free survival improvement. Another point that's important not every disease free survival difference, even as large as 7%, translates into overall survival difference. Because when you look at overall survival here in stage two, it washes out, it's completely gone. So, a 7%, even in high risk tumors, a 7% difference in disease free survival does not lead to any appreciable difference in long term overall survival. That's an important point. Now, on the other hand, you all know the longer you treat patients with oxaplatin based therapy, the more they have neurotoxicity. And I do believe these data are underappreciated. You know, we sometimes stop asking patients after five years how's your neuropathy? They've learned to live with their numb feet, with their tingling. Prestige, as you know, they just don't complain about these things anymore. So we completely underappreciate the long-term effects of neuropathy. And we cure patients and make them, make them live with their neuropathy for the rest of their lives. So until the IDEA collaboration came around here, we had several trials which tried to improve upon Falfox or Kpox, which added, for instance, bevacizumab, cetuximab, you know, in various different studies. And the body of evidence, the whole body of evidence of Falfox and Kpox as control arms was about 5,300 patients. That's what we had. All studies combined. I'm going to keep that in mind. And we accepted that it, there was a disease-free survival range in three-year disease-free survival between these studies between 71 and 78%. We said, oh, that's all more or less the same. Okay, wide range. Up comes the IDEA collaboration, which was, <clears throat> is an honor, late breaking abstract one, so plenary session one, which uh, made us very happy, which you can see from the long list of names was a large international collaboration. So it really tried to, what we tried to do was to see, can we shorten the duration of adjuvant therapy instead of giving six months of oxaplatin-based treatment? What about three months? And for that, you need to be very careful about statistical assumptions, and I'll come back to that in a minute. You need a large collaboration. And everyone in this worldwide endeavor was actually on board based on the unmet need that we had. We wanted to have a shorter duration of therapy and wanted to needed to show that we do this, reduce toxicity without major loss of efficacy, because we are curing patients in this setting. So that's a very important point. So this is what happened. So the idea of collaboration was a prospective endeavor which started more than a decade ago. No industry funding. Do you think any company would fund a shorter duration of therapy to investigate that? Not if this was an academic collaboration, philanthropy, government funds, intergroup money, 12, uh, 12 countries, six trials, and he included 12,834 patients. Remember, all the whole body of evidence of all trials combined before was 5,300. That is huge. It's a huge endeavor, which was coordinated prospectively by a Mayo Clinic. So instead of running a large international trial with 12,000 patients, which you cannot do because you have, don't have the money to do that, we allowed every single country, every single group to design their own trials, prepare the data in a pre-specified form. The protocols were more or less identical, but they gave us all the data and they signed a contract that they could not publish the individual data before the whole group published the data, not to confuse things. So let's talk a little bit about stage three colon cancer, because that's what we're really facing. So when you look at how many patients actually get cured by chemotherapy, and you can see here of the 100 patients that we see here, these are about 15 patients get cured by fluoroprimidins, an additional about seven patients get, get cured by oxaplan. Oxaplan, when I, when I talk to my patient, I always say the contribution of adrenal therapy is two-thirds fluoroprimidin, one-third oxaplan. This is really what matters. You know, the fluoroprimidin is probably more important than the oxaplan, but we add to it, of course. 
Now, what did IDEA do? IDEA allowed individual countries, individual study groups to choose, and in, in the investigators to choose between Falfox and Kpox, because we thought, you know, this was more or less identical. Falfox, Kpox, Kipsiden, Boxerplatin. And they all had a randomization three versus six months, 12,800 patients. And we allowed a, in statistical terms, an upper limit of the 95% confidence interval of the hazard ratio of 1.12. 1.12, meaning we accepted with a 5% chance or risk a 12% detriment in outcome between three months versus six months. That's very conservative, very conservative. You sometimes see non inferiority trials with hazard ratios up to 1.3, you know, as upper uh, limit of confidence interval. And when you look at this from a statistical perspective, it's not easy to wrap your head around non inferiority because normally we look at trials, we want to improve things. You want to make sure that we're not sacrificing efficacy too much. So when this is three months, this is six months, this is a hazard ratio estimate of one, meaning completely identical. If your hazard ratio confidence interval is all on the left side, actually three months would be better than six months, which we, of course, don't expect. On the other hand, this part here, if everything's on the right-hand side of one, it's inferior. Or let's say six months would be superior. And of course, this is what we like to see, the whole hazard ratio estimate confidence interval below 1.12. And this would be something where we just don't know. It's not proven. The estimate, the point estimate lies in the range that we are supposed to have, but we have not ruled out an inferiority based on pre-specified 1.12 with a 5% uh, uh, risk. So these are all the trials. And I can t tell you it took a lot of effort to integrate data from six trials and having 12,800 patients with quality control, data cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are all the different studies conducted around the world. And there's some interesting parts. So first of all, there are some imbalances between these studies, whether or not patients with T4 tumors were involved. N2 was actually quite balanced, you know, between, but the very important point, very important point, Cape, the use of capecidinboxaplatin differed between trials. For instance, the U.S. trial did not even allow capecidinboxaplatin because we are just not using it here as much. But there are other countries like the Japanese trial, the U.K. trial, where it was preferentially used. And this was not randomized. There was no randomization for Fox Capo. This was up to the investigator patient to make a decision. What is what you want to use? So the difference here is very important, because we'll come back to that in a minute. Then, of course, the differences in follow-up. I mean, the Tosca trial, the Italian trial, has now more than five years of follow-up. So the data actually quite solid. Adverse events, I mean, as expected, and as expected when you shorten the duration of therapy, you actually reduce toxicity, especially neurotoxicity. It's really like when you double duration of oxaplatin-based therapy, you triple the neurotoxicity. That is what it is, because it's not linear. It's actually more, you know, toward the end of the treatment, patients have more neurotoxicity. And how is that important? So this is a, a, a slide from the Scott trial, from the UK trial, where they followed patients up to five years. And in the blue dots here are the patients treated with three months of oxaplatin based therapy, and the green ones are the six months of treatment. You can see this is neurotoxicity questionnaire. Neurotoxicity flares up here, and you can see then there's this interesting coasting phenomenon. You sometimes stop treatment, and the neurotoxicity gets worse for some time, then gets better. I think that's something we all appreciate. But even after five years, there's still a difference between whether a patient had three months or six months of therapy. And that's what we want to achieve. The next slide shows you the primary endpoint, overall uh, study group. This is what it is. OK. So there are many things to say about this. So first of all, I dare, I cannot even put a laser pointer between these curves, yeah, overall. On the other hand, we did not meet non-inferiority. So from a statistical perspective, the study did not meet its primary endpoint of non-inferiority. Now, when you look at the estimates for disease-free survival, overall, we have a detriment of 0.9% as an estimate. Remember how little, how that small differences in disease-free survival do not translate into overall survival difference. We know that. This is not going to affect overall survival. But this study is negative. Now, I've... In the post-ASCO presentation, 
there was a, a, a colleague from Israel who actually, you know, we had a long discussion about is this negative, positive, what does it mean in clinical practice, whatever, and he got up, you know, when I look at this slide, and I'm 70 years old, my eyesight isn't great, I see one curve. And when, my, when I look at my patients who show these data, and they might also be elderly patients with colorectal cancer, they might also only see one curve. So now we have to make sense of this. We have to apply this to clinical practice. And you know, in spite of the fact that this was not proven, that's the, it's not it's superior, inferior, it's just not proven, we need to see what else can we get out of these data. Because you can't just say the trial is negative. We have 12,800 patients. We have pre-specified analysis for stage and treatment regimen. And we found actually something very interesting, which really changed my standard of care. Now, when you look at the high-risk and low-risk patients, and high-risk and low-risk ident identified by NNT status, and I can show you that later, you know, when you see the data for three-year disease-free survival, that low-risk patients have a three-year disease-free survival rate above 80%, and high-risk patients, even with modern adjuvant chemotherapy, it's 60%. There's a 20% difference between high risk and low risk, even in 2017. There's an unmet need for these patients. Now we look at KBOX and FALFOX. And the difference between KBOX and FALFOX is the largest unexpected finding we had in IDEA. Again, non-randomized, but it's very consistent. I'll show you what happened. Okay. For low risk patients with KBOX, KBOX-Cyplan, there's absolutely no question that this is non-inferior. Three months of KBOX is a very good substitute for six months. You know, KBOX has continuous administration of capsidibin, meaning a fluoropyrimidine, which might be the best way to use a fluoropyrimidine in the adjuvant setting. On the other hand, FALFOX for high-risk tumors is inferior. Six, you really need six months, uh, three months of FALFOX. So you really need six months of FALFOX. So when you commit to FALFOX you, in high-risk patient, you are locked into six months. Now, what about in between? Now, here is the high-risk group for patients. So first of all, when you look at every patient treated with KPOX, independent of stage, it is non-inferior. Actually, the estimates here are even trending better for three months, which, of course, is a statistical flu. So you could say for the whole study group, KPOX three months is all you need. It's all you need for high-risk and low-risk patients. For high-risk patients, the uh, confidence interval did cross 1.12, but it's a smaller group of patients, you know, confidence interval intervals are wider. But when you look at the point estimate for the three-year disease for your survival, 64.164. That's identical. There's really no difference. Fox always trended poor in terms of three, year, three uh, months versus six months performance. And when you look at what we call, how, how do these different factors, risk and regimen, really affect the outcomes, the only thing that stood out in all the analysis in this 12,800 patient clientele was KBOX did better than FALFOX. In my clinical practice, I've switched my patients to KBOX. And that might be a learning curve for us you know, how to use this treatment, but I believe, and we have thought about this now for half a year, we have almost daily emails going back and forth trying to explain these data, and we believe as a group, and you'll see the paper hopefully published very soon, that the continuous administration of fluoropyrimidines, as it is in capsaicin moxaplat, is probably the best way to treat patients. If you want a shorter duration of therapy, you don't need a longer duration. So at ASCO, we presented this year when we had kind of just not wrapped our heads around it, we said we've kind of made a treatment duration choice based on, re on the risk factor. And I still believe, you know, when you have T1, 2, 3, N1, even with FALFOX, the detriment is not that large. It's a clinical decision to make. But I, now I would have probably do a regimen-based approach. If you have, if you embark on CAPOX, CAPSIDEN, OXAPLATIN, and you feel kind of comfortable using it, Three months of therapy, even for higher risk stage three patients, is the right way to go. In two and a half weeks, we'll have an NCCN guidelines conference. This is the main topic that we'll have to, which might influence NCCN guidelines. So that is something we're discussing at this point in time. I would like to actually probably 
Now we can go through a little bit more and then we'll take questions because I really want to make sure that because this affects potentially, I mean, in the in worldwide, 400,000 patients a year. And in the United States, about 20, 30,000 patients a year. That is something which we need to wrap our heads around. Sightedness, let me quickly look at this here. Does sight matter? You've seen various data that left-sided tumors uh, do better than right-sided tumors. Even in 2001, when we just had five of you, right and left-sided tumors were different. With the introduction of cetuximab as an egf receptor antibody, you, we see now, and this is very clear data, that at least in first-line treatment, right-sided tumors do not benefit. This is right-sided, this is left-sided, this is Fulfiri plus minus cetuximab. You see in PFS and overall survival, the benefit only comes in left-sided tumors. You see FIRE 3 data, and you see the CLGB data here. This is left-sided uh, tumor cetuximab, right-sided tumor cetuximab. When you look at bevacizumab, they are somewhat in the middle. Bevacizumab is sightedness agnostic. Um, I want to brush over this here. The NCCN guidelines have shown that, you know, we should not use egf receptor antibodies in, left, in the right-sided tumors in first-line treatment. And there's a discussion right now whether the NCCN guidelines should ban egf receptor antibodies from any line of therapy if you have right-sided tumors. So not even a later line setting. And I don't believe that's the way to go. So these are the, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. You look at Europeans and Americans look at the same data and they come to different conclusions. And in full disclosure, I'm a member of the ESMO and NCCN Guidelines Commission, so I see these two different ways to look at the data. So in, in the Europeans say, you know, in left-sided tumors, when you have a ras raf wild type tumor, each receptor antibodies are the standard of care. You should never use bevacizumab. In right-sided tumors, they say, yeah, there's no difference in PFS, but there might be slight increase in response rate, so you can use it if you want a response. The NCCN guidelines in left-sided tumors don't really tell you whether it's bevacizumab or cetuximab or panitumumab. They leave it up to us. And in right-sided tumors, they say no egf receptor antibodies in first line. And again, the discussion is likely not even in any line of therapy. There's a big push right now to do that. Now, when I... At a meeting, recent meeting, I was asked to see what is the truth. And I gave my, you know, it's nice to be ASMO, NCCN, and AG, um, to what do I think, you know, how these things are. And this is probably the last slide that I have because I want to really have some discussion with the adjuvant treatment. I do believe that in left sided tumors, RAS, RAF, bile type, each of septa antibodies are preferred. The data are very strong. There's superiority in left sided tumors, RAS, RAF, bile type over bevacizumab. At Mayo Clinic, we don't use cetuximab, we use panitumumab. So my standard of care right now in, in first-line treatment would be Forfox or Falfiri plus panitumumab. But only in patients with RAS, RAF, wild-type tumors, left-sided, and likely HER2 negative. That's something that's emerging right now. So eventually, it's about 20% of all patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. That's really where, and I do believe these patients are the ones who need cetuximab or panitumumab first-line. In right-sided tumors, I would not use egf receptor antibodies first line unless we have identified molecular signature that allows us to see which patient can be treated or not. Um, when you want a response rate, consider triplet. Folfoxiri works quite well. But I would not eliminate egf receptor antibodies from any line of therapy. I have patients in my practice, right-sided tumors, ras raf type, who respond to single-agent panitumab. This is not, we would not, should not eliminate this from our treatment algorithm. That's going to happen, it's the discussion will happen. So in the end, you know, this is really the perfect candidate for egf receptor antibody therapy. This is how I outlined this already. You have RAS wild type, BRAF wild type, HER2, likely no HER2 amplification. And then these are all mutually exclusive. Then you have further exclusion criteria, in particular right-sided tumors. Eventually, it narrows it down to about 20% of patients. And colon cancer is complicated. It's not left, it's now, uh, beyond to the molecular markers, there's left and right sidedness effect, probably effect also of the microbiome that's, uh, that's affecting the uh, response to therapy. So this is what you really need to keep in mind when you treat your patients with metastatic disease. And here I'll stop, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much.